this panel is about uh, alternative currencies. Uh, it's a very important topic for libertarians. If we're going to move to a different currency, the question is how is that going to happen? Because there are a lot of different options, and society will find it very unfamiliar, which is every single time you know and you discuss the issue of using a different currency, it just sounds impossible for anybody to think about that we will do accounting or exchange based on a different um, on a different unit of account. So, uh, without more delay, would you guys please introduce yourselves? First, introduce yourselves, and then okay. So, my name is Robert Murphy. I'm an economist at with the Free Market Institute at now Texas Tech University. It's up there in Lubbock, and uh, I guess the reason I'm here is I have co-authored with Silas Barta a a guide called Understanding Bitcoin that goes through the, the economics of Bitcoin and explains some of the mechanics of it. So that's at understandingbitcoin.us. It's a free download if you want to go there and, and read more. Hi, my name is Tatiana Moroz. I'm a singer-songwriter and Bitcoin advocate as well as an entrepreneur. Um, I work on several projects, but I also created uh, the first ever artist cryptocurrency to fund artists in a different way and allow them to engage with their fans. I wrote a Bitcoin jingle, I recorded an album completely funded with crypto, and a whole bunch of other fun stuff, so I'm looking forward to talking more about it. My name is Michael Badnarik. I'm a philosopher, author, a constitutional scholar, and um, I, I know how to talk about gold and silver. Uh, since we have about 50 minutes to discuss this, I would like for you guys to speak about 10 minutes and give us a little bit of an overview of what is uh, each of the currencies that you guys propose. And then from there, I think we can actually go to the uh, audience's questions. Does that sound, sound correct? Sounds nice? Okay. Okay, so I, I guess uh, my, my two things, I don't know if I would pick one, but I have been telling people about um, advising them to stock up on, on gold and Bitcoin, not necessarily for speculative reasons in the sense of um, that we're sure these things are going to go up in value, but given my my views of the overall economy, that I, I think that those are going to be, um, like is in terms of playing defense, that that's the thing you want to be uh, in. So just very briefly, I think that the, um, the Federal Reserve was responsible or at least contributed greatly to the housing boom and then bust, and because of artificially low interest rates, so if you buy that story, if that sounds plausible to you, then what Bernanke and now Yellen have been doing since 2008 is just that uh, times times five or six. And so you can see that, in my view, I think that's, that's sowing the seeds for what we're in now is another unsustainable boom that's going to crash. Just for one particular thing, if you've never seen this chart, to get, to get some empirical evidence behind what I'm saying, uh, don't do it now because I want you to listen to our panel, but just when you next time you're at a computer, just go to the Federal Reserve website, the Fred, St. Louis Fed's website, and chart the uh, S&P 500 index against the Federal Reserve's either balance sheet or the monetary base, if, you, if you're familiar with that terminology, and you can just see the two things move hand in glove since 2008, right? So the, the point being that the boom in the the apparent boom in the stock market since the trough after the dot com or sorry after the uh, financial crisis that in my mind that has been entirely driven by the federal reserve and so i think that they have set us up for another uh, crash and so in that kind of environment it's hard to know exactly what would happen my guess is that there's going to be a rush um, that i think probably european banks will get in trouble first there might paradoxically be a rush to the the U.S. dollar, as people flee that and they rush to what they perceive as being safety, but again, what the Fed has been doing, is, I believe, is built on a house of cards, and so perhaps after the euro goes down, the, the dollar would strengthen. I think ultimately it would seem like, oh no, this contagion has suddenly spread to U.S. banks for some reason, and, and the pundits won't really know what's going on, but the people who all along have known what they've been doing is unsustainable will be prepared. So in that sort of environment, I think having things that are tied to real assets that are outside of the conventional fiat currencies are going to go way up in value. But, but again, it's more, that's, that's like a, a hedge, an insurance policy against that. So the, the reason for the, the twofold of, of gold and Bitcoin is just those are the classic external currencies that, you know, gold has been around. That was the market's money all along. And so I think that's a, you know, very safe, hard money. But the problem, of course, is there's 
physical constraints on that. They, 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 I think there's lots of things. The authorities, obviously, in the 30s certainly took measures to crack down on people using gold. And so th there are those constraints. So I believe having something like Bitcoin is a great way to just have another alternative there. That also, in case things get really bad, and I'm not saying they will be this bad, but if they did happen to be this bad, where like actual you know, banks were shutting down and things like that, and, and if there were large-scale financial panics, that all you really need is an internet connection, and you can have access to commerce. So I think it's important that humanity get those alternative distribution and, and payment systems up and running uh, just to have that in place in case the conventional financial payments mechanism goes down at least temporarily that people have that fallback. So again, it, that's why I would say gold and, and Bitcoin and at least familiarize yourself with the mechanics of how do I go online and buy something with Bitcoin. Um, I have a, I guess what I'll do is I'll, I'll relate it back to my own journey. So I always um, thought that art and music um, really influenced culture. So that's how I found my way to libertarianism in a search to uh, improve the world around me and to find a message that I could uh, sing about and that I could hopefully you know, bring other people into the fold. Um, I was very active in the Ron Paul movement. You know, I was singing around the country and that was great. And then I went to the RNC and I spent the entire time in Tampa crying because I was so sad that it wasn't real. And I didn't um, think after experiencing all the um, electoral fraud and all the rule breaking and all of the media, um, you know, blackouts, that politics was really a good solution. Uh, I also found that if I told somebody I was a libertarian, and even though they may agree with me on a certain issue, that would put the wall up because they identified as a Republican or a Democrat. And then, you know, the conversation was basically over before it started just because of that label. As an artist that wants to bring people together, this obviously posed a problem. Um, I continue to believe in the ideology and, and probably progressed almost into, I guess, the anarcho-capitalist mindset um, based on those experiences. And at the same time, you know, people just weren't coming to the events. I had heard about Bitcoin in August of 2012 at the same time that I became disillusioned with the political process. and. I didn't want to hear about it. I thought it was super boring, and I hoped that the people that were telling me about it would please stop talking so I could enjoy my Afghan kebab. Um, and so I gave them money to shut them up, and then, you know, uh, the Bitcoins were $11 at that point. And then when they went up to $100, it became a lot more interesting all of a sudden. Imagine how that happens. And um, I was hanging out with Jeffrey Tucker, and we took this long drive from uh, San Diego all the way up to Malibu. And during that time, in uh, you know, he played for me Justin Bieber and Gregorian Chants. And in between that, he told me about Bitcoin. And I think that there was something about the way that he's so passionate about it and could kind of make it more of a creative thing versus uh, the really nerdy other ways that it had been tried to be explained to me um, that really got me excited about it. And so I thought, all right, well, we need a song for this, right? Because this messaging isn't really working for me. So I made a Bitcoin jingle, and in that song, I kind of tried to infuse the ideology behind it. You know, there were a lot of people that were looking for freedom when they went into Bitcoin, and that was a really cool kind of environment. I ended up going to the cryptocurrency convention in Atlanta, and I didn't understand what anybody was talking about, but I recognized that same hope that was bringing together so many people in the Ron Paul movement. You know, when we first started with, well, for me, it was 2012. I know all you guys are cooler than me and we were there for a long time. But in 2012, when I got there, there were Democrats, there were Republicans, everybody was get there and excited. And they felt like they could all contribute. And I think that um, Bitcoin has that same thing about it, right? Because um, I'm a musician and somehow I found a, a reason to care about Bitcoin. You know, other people are from finance. There's the charitable giving angle. I mean, there are a lot of different people that benefit from it and can build their businesses around it. Uh, when I guess there was almost like a light question, you know, which is the currency to choose? And I don't know. I mean, I like Bitcoin because it seems to be the most stable out of all of them. And there's, uh, you know, I have, I guess, a little affinity for it. But I think that there are a lot of other options out there. And one of the really cool things about cryptocurrency is um, that you actually get people to start thinking about what is money. And I think that that mental shift is almost bigger than the, the this specific currency is better than that one or whatever. Because when I look at my wallet pre 
you know, Federal Reserve days, someone tells me, oh, what is money? I'm like, what are you, an idiot? It's just stuff in my pocket or not in my pocket. Um, and, and then people would, uh, you know, and now that they have Bitcoin, then you could start thinking about, well, what gives money value? Uh, why do I think this piece of paper is worth something? And what we ended up doing was experimenting with uh, another problem that I had run into as a singer-songwriter, which is that you can't get funding unless you sign with a record label, and then your record label tells you, no, you will not sing an anti-war song. Shut up and toe the party line, and yes, Obama is your savior. And that didn't appeal to me. And um, you know, maybe some people that's good for, but overall, I'm not even making a call on the messaging, but as an artist, you should be uh, able to speak your message without having somebody else tell you what to say. And so what we did was we created the first ever artist cryptocurrency. Now, you've probably heard about crowdfunding before. And crowdfunding is great because, you know, you donate money, you get a t-shirt, you get a cookie, whatever, and then, you know, that's great because you can help get uh, projects off of the ground. But there are also some limitations with that. Uh, if I um, have a $25 price point and Mary wants to give me $25, but all I have is a manly t-shirt and she wants to wear a tank top, well, she's SOL because she's got a manly tank top because that's all I can sell her. And if she wants to get rid of uh, the, the shirt or whatever, she can't because she needs to find somebody who's in her size who wants a manly shirt. Um, and maybe it's in pink, so that'll be super confusing. <laughs> uh, so with the Tatiana coin, when you donate money, right, you can get back coins that you can use in my store at any time. Uh, you can maybe you have all my albums at this time, which you should. Uh, then maybe in in a year you don't want to buy an album. You want to buy a house concert. You want to get some other sort of experience. You want to message with me directly. Uh, you want me to cover a song for your girlfriend and like propose on your behalf or something. Uh, there's all there's an infinite amount of things that I can offer you for those coins, and also you can send those coins around to all your friends, right? You don't have to necessarily use the prize yourself. In fact, you can sell those coins to somebody else. You don't necessarily have to give them to anyone. So that was part of it. And then there was another angle, right? So I have a business card, and it says MySpace on it. And it's super embarrassing, right? Because it ages me, and I look like I'm not hip and in time. But um, I think it actually sort of illustrates a point, besides that I don't feel like buying new business cards. It also shows that all these platforms that we sign up for and we build our communities around them can change. MySpace is no longer popular. Facebook, if I put out a post, I have 6,000 likes on my page, right? 37 people, for some reason, that seems to be the magic number that Facebook assigns, are allowed to see my post. And if you're my fan, you're getting screwed because you can't find out about my next show in your town. And as an artist, now all of a sudden I have to fork over money to Facebook in order to reach my fans because they changed the rules. That's not how it always was. And that's really frustrating because now we're going back to the original problem. I don't have any money. So artist coins can solve the problem of connecting you directly to your fans, cutting out the middleman, because no one will ever change the rules except for you. And if you know that's up to you to do that. And then you're also able to get funding from people who believe in you. And now you don't have to deal with record labels, which not only will they make you the worst loan in the world, but they won't even tell you what they're spending your budget on. So when they're asking you, hey, by the way, you owe us a million dollars, and you're like, wait, what? Why do I owe you a million dollars? I ordered cheeseburgers. No stakes for me. So uh, I think you know when I did that project, right, we're, we're launching it. We're making it an app. Uh, I'm putting it out in tandem with my third album, which was funded completely with crypto. But what I find really compelling about my use case is that it's a model that can not only be used for other artists, but for other businesses. You know, if you want to open up a bakery, yeah, you could do a crowdfund, but the administration of a crowdfund is really difficult. Okay, what if you don't want cupcakes? What if you want a cake? Now you can't do it because you only bought cupcake uh, equivalents, right? So I think that, I guess, with, with these kinds of experiments, you start thinking about how do we uh, make ourselves valuable? And also, if your coin's value fluctuates, all of a sudden you have a different incentive to create work, right? When you go to work, right, you sit around on Facebook, you pay, pay your bills, you do whatever you can so you're, you don't get fired. You basically do the bare minimum because you don't like your boss. But if you had a coin that was sort of almost a rating system saying, this person is worth a lot, they're a really good worker, then all of a sudden you're almost working for yourself. And now you're going to think about uh, approaching work differently. And if all of a sudden everybody would have a good work ethic and I would stop getting annoyed everywhere I go, <laughs> which would be good. Um, 
So I think that that's where cryptocurrency has a lot of power. Uh, I mean, you could talk about how Bitcoin can uh, be sent across the world for fractions of a penny. Uh, you can give money to women in Afghanistan, and now they don't have to hide gold under their beds and hope that they can maybe run away surreptitiously in the night. They actually have a way of uh, getting themselves out of poverty. Uh, there's two billion unbanked people in the world. You can't get a bank account in some countries, which to me sounds great because I'm not really a fan of Chase. But to them, it's terrible because you can't get out of poverty if you have no way of storing your value and transferring your value. So while those are those are some of the exciting things, I also think that we could start thinking about alternative methods of um, of exchanging value on multitude of levels, and cryptocurrency allows us to do that. So that's why I love Bitcoin. And now we're going to hear about gold. I want to um, define a couple of uh, terms, first of all want to differentiate between price and value. Value is based on how badly you want something. Um, let's say you have a uh, oil painting of Elvis on black velvet. You know, the question is, you know, what's the value of that? Well, you're not getting any money from me. Um, that, that painting of Elvis probably worked really well in my fireplace, but I'm not going to pay money for it. Somebody else might be a big, you know, you know, supporter of the king. They think they would great great in their living room. And they may give you big, you know, quite a few dollars for it. So value and price are two different things. Another example, you can go to the grocery store and for, you know, two, two and a half bucks, you can buy eight hot dogs, the buns, ketchup, and mustard, and go home and, you know, make lunch for you and your kids. If you're at the airport between flights, you're going to pay, you know, four bucks for a single hot dog that's been sitting there on the rollers for hours and hours, and, you know, it's not going to taste nearly as good. So, you know, how is the hot dog at the uh, airport more valuable? Why are you going to pay a higher price at the airport? Well, because you've got 30 minutes to get your next flight, and you don't have time to go to the grocery store and get the cheap hot dog. And so you're willing to pay for the convenience. You're not paying for the hot dog. So prices go up and down. You go to buy a used car, it may start with $10,000. You know, the sign is $10,000 on the windshield. But then you start, you know, kicking the tires and negotiating. And, you know, you offer $3,000. The salesman comes back and says, okay, $750. And, you know, you eventually walk away with this car for $6,000. So what was the value of that car? You know, value is whatever you're willing to get for it. You know, the salesman wants to get as high a price. The customer wants to get as low a price. And, you know, you negotiate. So price varies. Value has a tendency to vary. It depends on whether people want it or not. Why do people value the American dollar? Because you can use the American dollar. You can buy your $4 hot dog at the airport. You buy your $2.50 you know, $2 hot dogs at the grocery store. You, you don't want the paper dollar. You want what the paper dollar can be exchanged for. So the value that that paper has to you is that that, that paper has value to somebody else, and you can trade. It's a really convenient form of barter. So you're going to exchange your labor effort for somebody else's labor effort. That is the purpose of currency. Currency is the exchange uh, from one person to another. Now, when we're in second grade, we invent barter. Your mother has been giving you peanut butter sandwiches every day for two weeks. You cannot stand peanut butter. Your friend has been getting a ham and cheese sandwich every day for two weeks. If they see another ham and cheese sandwich, they're going to gag. So you're sitting in the cafeteria and you go, wow, peanut butter? You want to trade? And so in second grade, we're already inventing barter, where both parties end up with something that they consider more valuable, something they want more than they had. What people don't understand is that 
the Federal Reserve note has been counterfeited for 103 years. Most of us here probably know that. <laughs> now, um, I've written two books. The second book is not for sale. I won't take um, monopoly money for it. Why? Because monopoly money is just worthless paper. If your great-grandpappy was in the Civil War and you have this trunk full of Confederate money, I won't take Confederate money for my book because Confederate money is worthless paper. And for the same logic, I refuse to take Federal Reserve notes because the Federal Reserve note that you currently expect to be money is literally worthless paper. And it only has value to you now because other people are still willing to accept it from you. Now, whether you've been paying attention or not, we've got five countries referring to themselves as BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. They have formed a coalition. They've resolved never to use US dollars again. When that happens, the economy in the United States is gonna be radically different and Nobody is going to want your Federal Reserve notes. The value of your Federal Reserve notes is going to go to zero. And you'll be able to light your cigar with it. Might make a good YouTube video. But that's about all the value it's going to have to you. It's going to be kindling for the fireplace. That type of stuff happens very rapidly. If you go to my website, I have a... Um, archive link to uh, hypercurrency. Most of you are not familiar with the, um, uh, the Republic in Germany between World War I and World War II, where they printed money so fast that when you went to the grocery store, there was a price in the morning, a higher price in the afternoon, and a still higher price in the evening. That's how fast inflation was moving. The workers would get their check, they would run to the fence, give their money, their wives the money. Their wives would spend all the money now while it was still worth something. So, one of the questions here philosophically is, well, you know, how do you get people out of the burning house? You don't have to get them out of the burning house. Once they realize the house is burning, they're gonna come running out into the parking lot on their own. You're not gonna have to give them any clues problem is you can't tell them in advance that the house is on fire because they won't believe you. If you walk around now and tell people that, you know, the U.S. dollar, the Federal Reserve note is completely and totally worthless, they'll laugh at you because they can go out, they can buy beer, they can buy their hockey tickets, and it still works. When it stops working, then they're going to be coming to ask you what are they going to do. My recommendation is you need something of tangible value. Gold and silver have been used for about 6,000 years. And there's a reason for that. You cannot counterfeit gold and silver. They have an intrinsic value. And for at least 6,000 years, everybody wants it. That's the, you know, the quality of a useful currency, that somebody else wants it. Well, <clears throat> just about any commodity will work. Ammunition will work really well. Even if you don't own a gun, if you have a large storage, you know, uh, store of ammunition, when the U.S. dollar becomes worthless and everybody knows it, you'll be able to trade ammunition for the stuff that you want, perhaps food and water. So... This is not a philosophical question. This is going to happen in the United States. The question is, what are you going to value after the uh, Federal Reserve note is understood to be worthless? Um, it, it's a personal choice. Gold and silver are one option. Uh, Bitcoin is another. There are, like I said, just about any commodity. You know, toilet paper. Toilet paper is gonna be highly valuable. People are going to want that. So if you have a storehouse of 
you know, toilet paper, you'll be able to trade that stuff to people who want it and need it for the things that you need and want. And anything else is just, you know, filling in the blank. And now to the audience, do you guys happen to have any questions that you guys would like to ask our panel panelists? Okay, ladies first, so yes. I don't know what the value of the uh, Chinese currency is, but I do know that for the last six years, China has been buying gold like crazy. Um, they have been storing up tangible value. So once, and there's supposed to be a global economic reset where everybody goes, you know, this whole thing sucks and we need to come up with a different system. When that happens, or if that happens, it doesn't matter how much uh, paper money China has printed. What will matter is how much gold they have to back up the currency that they have, because their currency will then be represented by a tangible commodity. Yeah, I'll just jump in on that for the next question, too. It's um, for, I think, Everyone in here is probably vaguely familiar with it, but for a while, the Chinese government and then other financial institutions over there were accumulating U.S. treasuries and other dollar-denominated assets. And so loosely speaking, people could say, and there was some truth to it, that that's what's allowing our trade deficits to, to be possible, right? And so, again, this is loosely speaking, but it's like the, the Federal Reserve was creating dollars that were then going over to China, and they were sending us goods in exchange. And that could work so long as the Chinese were happy to keep accumulating a growing stockpile of dollar-denominated assets. And people were saying, but, but gee, what happens when they, like Peter Schiff, for example, you know, famously he wrote it very well in, in pithy examples and so on, would say, what happens when the Chinese suddenly realize, okay, we don't want to keep accumulating more dollars now that they're running you know, with all the QEs. And I remember people were poo-pooing that is saying, oh, come on, that would never happen. They hold so much dollar dynamic debt, that would be stupid. They would be ruining their own assets. Well, just last year, I haven't looked and seen what the exact number is now, but the Chinese holdings of U.S. Treasuries has gone way down, and the people are you know, not alarmed, and they're like the you know, CNBC analysts and whatever, just explaining that away. Oh, well, that's just because, yeah, they, they revalued the currency vis-a-vis -vis the dollar, and it's blah, 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 blah. But the thing that they were assuring us would never happen is happening before our eyes, and as usual, you know, they're just they're just saying, "Oh, don't worry about that. It's just it's no big deal." So, uh, a lot of things that people before said were would never happen are happening, and so what used to be a, a crazy paranoid conspiracy theory is already partially becoming true. So I definitely agree that uh, you're going to see other countries like once one major country dumps the dollar, it's going to happen fast, as as he's saying. Um, I'll just make one brief comment and see if you guys want to chime in. I, I, my reading of the situation is it seems like the people running the Chinese government have a longer-term view. And, yeah, as he's saying, I think there's evidence that they're accumulating gold. So it looks like, if I had to guess, they don't want to provoke a, a, a military confrontation with the West because they don't need to. They can just sit back and let, let us hang ourselves and, and you know, have a longer-term view. Somebody else? He was jotting some. Yeah, so the question was, aren't we, yeah, you know, we're, we're recommending things here. What if the government comes in and you know, d takes measures to out to outlaw those things. Wouldn't you say, "Oh yeah, I called it right, but now it's illegal to hold this stuff"? So, um, my for me, that's partly why I don't just say one or the other. I mean, if if I were sure the government wouldn't mess with people holding gold, I would ha have no problem 
telling everyone to do that is, is a head. I, I like Bitcoin. I think it's cool to study it, but in terms of just protecting normal people, and plus there's, there's not as much of a learning curve. Like to, if I try to tell my parents to go figure out Bitcoin, they would say, I, I just can't. We lost you with Nintendo, you know, and so they, would, they wouldn't be able to do that. Whereas I can tell my dad, go buy gold and silver coins and hang on to them. Like he gets what that means. So I hope my dad doesn't see this video. It sounds very uh, patronizing, condescending. Um, so, but that's why for more sophisticated people, I do say, yeah, you might also want to look a bit because that is, uh, you know, intangible. The, the way they would crack down on Bitcoin is qualitatively different from how they would crack down on holdings of gold. But as, as you know, Bitcoin has its, its problems too. There's ways they can, so to me, it's, uh, I'm not denying your concern. And I'm just saying, yeah, that's why I'm saying like go, go for both because they have different pros and cons. Um, I would say that, you know, if the government could have stopped Bitcoin, I think that they would have definitely gotten on that already. They were not happy with, uh, for example, the Silk Road case is, you know, controversial. And today we were talking earlier, and it's not about, in my opinion, the Silk Road wasn't about the drugs. It was about the platform because uh, and what it stood for. And, uh, and that was, you know, Chuck Schumer was the one who led the charge against... Silk Road. Why? Uh, maybe because he was the head of the banking committee and he saw that Bitcoin was gaining value and utility. Um, while I, I do think that, sure, we need to worry if the government is going to try and outlaw these things or make it more difficult for us to use. Um, and also, a lot of people think that Bitcoin, well, I guess this is part of it, right? Bitcoin is known as anonymous, but it's actually not. You have to take a lot of care in order to make yourself anonymous while using Bitcoin. So in a weird way, they can kind of track your behavior if you're sloppy a lot more easily than if you had cash. And then alternately, uh, a project that I'm working on uh, called Fermat, for example, is um, allowing people to not need that third-party service to provide them with Bitcoin services. So, for example, if I go to Coinbase and I put my money into Coinbase, the government says, oh, Tatiana, this radical brat, we're going to get rid of her. Shut her, shut her down, Coinbase, or we're going to throw you in jail. And then Coinbase has to say, oh, you're right, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And, and so that's how they would be able to do it. But with a project like Vermont or similar, um, the, the wallets are end-to-end -end encrypted and it's like a peer-to-peer -peer system. So... There's nobody to shut down. It's open source and, and it's decentralized, so they're going to have a harder time. So I think that technology is going to catch up to that cat and mouse game of the government um, in terms of preventing people from using it. And yeah, I guess if they catch you and they find you know, illegal bitcoins on your phone, then maybe they could throw you in jail. But I think they'd have a hard time throwing lots and lots of people into it uh, in, you know, off the trail, I guess. When people ask for my advice, I tell them to invest in precious metals, gold, silver, and lead. And they go, well, what's the lead for? I said, to protect the gold and silver. Comes in little conical shapes. I mean, <laughs> if the government passes a law and that law says you have to get down on all fours and bark like a dog, are you going to do that? Are you going to follow the law because the government said so the government says gold is illegal and you have to turn in your gold. Are you really naive enough to send your gold to Washington? When you become President of the United States, you take an oath to protect and defend the Constitution, which implies that you're going to protect and defend the life, liberty, and private property of the people in the United States. Gold is property. So FDR passes House Joint Resolution 192, says gold is illegal and you have to turn in your gold? How did he get off the balcony with nobody putting a bullet in his head? He's in a wheelchair. He can't be that hard to hit. And as bizarre as that sounds to me, Americans were turning in their gold and, oh, we're going to send FDR. He's going to save us from the Depression. How stupid can you be? If FDR says, well, Congress is a little bit depressed. We need to boost their morale. So, you know, gussy up your teenage daughters and send them to Washington, D.C. with a suitcase. Are you going to do that too? At some point, you have to have a brain in your head. And you've got to say, no, I am not going to follow that law because it's stupid. It is detrimental to my survival. And the government doesn't have the authority to tell me I cannot own gold. So yes, 
invest in gold, silver, and lots of lead. Next question. So I, I want to address some of the uh, things that you mentioned earlier, which is in the previous crisis, despite the fact that it started in the U.S., um, the fact that the rest of the governments were considered more volatile or more at risk ended up resulting in a flee towards safety, towards the dollar. So uh, you know, I, and it, the economies are so interconnected today that chances are we're going to see something similar. So my question to you is, we're, we saw this contradiction. On the other hand, gold is fantastic to have, but it's difficult to pay for. I mean, you can't pay with gold over the internet. Bitcoin you can, but you have $5 billion. The, the entire market worth of Bitcoin is $5 billion. You, you can't imagine um, supply chain, big payments. It's, it's a minute marketplace. So. How do you kind of, when you think about how this could work and play out, what's your view on, on how you can, you know, overcome some of these limitations? Okay. This is like decentralized hosting functions. Um, so, yeah, the, uh, the, it's a great question. I certainly, it's not, how can I put it? If everybody tomorrow, or let's say Monday, let's say they don't want to do it on the week, weekend, tried to embrace these ideas and rush into Bitcoin, yeah, that might, overwhelm the network but I mean that's realistically these these things are going to happen with marginal improvements so more and more people would gradually adopt it and, and they're, they're building infrastructure I know that's like one of the controversies over you know the the, the developers as to you know the, the vision for the future and, and processing transactions per per hour and that sort of thing so as these things develop over time yes that's that's going to happen um, they couldn't all rush to it but I, again, but it's like it's like people saying, "Oh, if you, if you're warning that the U.S. stock market is overvalued, well, gee, if everybody tried to sell on Monday, the whole thing would collapse," and that's true. And I think that's what actually make the price that it should be, be, be come to the forefront sooner. But nonetheless, that's not going to probably happen. And that you know, when you tell people the truth sooner, th then they can at least protect themselves and take measures too. So, assuming that my economic analysis is generally correct. The more you know, the sooner people hear that and act on it, the better off they're going to be. And what more? And it's true. If if everybody acted on it right away, then it might be harder for them. You know, they wouldn't gain any relative advantage, but it would still be better for the whole system. It's it's not good. Like these artificially low interest rates, people continuing to go to the mall and and spend more than they they really have. It's not good for this illusion to persist. But nonetheless, what more can we do than to try to tell you know individuals one at a time to go and get and get ready for the storm that's coming. At one point in time, mostly before your time, writing a check was an unusual experience. I mean, people used not only, well, the, the paper that we had was not Federal Reserve notes. They were silver certificates or gold certificates. And I have examples of those that I use in my constitution class. The, but people would actually pay in gold and silver, physical metal. And eventually the banks came up with like, you know, the metal is heavy. That's the one disadvantage, is that it's physically heavy and awkward to carry around. So we're going to come up with this system where we're going to give you this little tablet of paper and you write how much you want to transfer out of your, and you autograph it. It's like, that's it? You're going to give me groceries because I wrote my name on a piece of paper? And people were astonished. It's like, oh, my God. Well, now, I mean, people don't go anywhere without a checkbook. You know, they buy, a, you know, $5 worth of groceries. And I'm sitting there waiting for them to fill out the damn check. Come on, hand them a fiver and get the hell out of my way. Credit cards were a novelty. It's like plastic? All I have to do is have this little piece of plastic? Well, women went nuts. It's like, whoa, 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 you know? And, and they could go out and buy all sorts of things. But it, at one point in time, it wasn't a common social event. It was something that people got used to. Your concern is, OK, gold and silver are valuable, but it's hard to get people to take it. Yeah, 
because right now people don't value that. I go to the store, I offer them money. I hand them silver. And they go, God, I can't take that. I said, well, the only thing I have left are Federal Reserve notes. I mean, counterfeit. And they go, you got what? And so I pull out the Federal Reserve notes. They go, oh, yeah, that's what I want. And I said, so you don't want the money, the valuable money. You're willing to take the counterfeit. Okay. That is going to change. There is going to be a huge social upheaval based on value. Today, people value Federal Reserve notes because they don't understand the system, and this is what they can use to buy their beer on Saturday. When the economy crashes, not if, when the economy crashes and nobody is willing to take your Federal Reserve notes, you better have an alternative. And now is the time to decide what your alternative is going to be. I'm, I am betting that when the paper dollar is worthless, people are going to be begging me for my silver and gold. And toilet paper. <laughs> Any other questions? I just uh, have a question. So directed at the first gentleman to the left. Um, is something happening in June that doubling or with the rate that it goes? <laughs> I don't know how to term it. The having. Tell us about the having and what to expect for a few weeks on that. And as an investor. Okay, I, I mean, I can speak vaguely about that. So, the, yeah, the way my, what's called mining and Bitcoin works, and if you go to the understandingbitcoin.us, the, the, the manual that we wrote explains it better because this was more where the co-author, you know, wrote the thing. He really understands it. And my role was to say, wait, I still don't get it, so rewrite that section. Um, but, yeah, the, they reward... Um, my, Mining operations, this is how new Bitcoins come into existence, right? So ultimately, it's going to peak at 21 million. It's not there right now. So where do the new Bitcoins come from? It's they reward it in terms of mining. You know, computers that verify certain transactions are then awarded new Bitcoins. And, and for those Bitcoins, that now they're born. And so the idea is that um, the rate at which they pay people for making the, those computations, uh, 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 once in a while, will get cut in half. And so it's not like a smooth, because at some point that it needs to go to zero, because otherwise the number of Bitcoins would keep growing. So the, you know, there's various dates at which that happens. L let me say uh, off the top of my head, I do, do you know? Is it? OK, so it's every four years. And so is she, is she right that it's in June? Yeah, so it's, I mean, it does matter. Yeah, there are big, but. People would know this and see it coming, so it's not like it's going to catch them by surprise. So presumably, the you know the internal people know that. So my my guess would be you wouldn't see like a huge change in the price. Just like it's not like every July Fourth, the price of fireworks stocks all of a sudden goes through the roof. Like people kind of know that stuff. I mean, in my experience, uh, people in Bitcoin are excited for the having. We all think we're going to be rich. But if everybody thinks that, then there might be an artificial um, bubble that comes from people that are rushing in to buy Bitcoin right before that happens. But maybe not, uh, because people know that other people are doing it. So it might create a little bubble. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I used to think a lot about Bitcoin price, and I still do to a certain extent. But it's less exciting now because it's sort of stabilized and not as exciting because I'm not making, you know, 10 times returns. So I think that if you want to get into Bitcoin, 
maybe don't worry about the price that much. Don't necessarily think of it only as a speculative vehicle. Maybe think of it as another place to maybe perhaps invest some of your money and then also use it as a backup. Um, you know, gold and silver are really great, but if you have to leave a country, you're not just going to take them on your back because they're heavy and they're hard to transfer around. Uh, there's a company called Voltoro, and Voltoro, uh, there's a few different companies that do Bitcoin and gold. Uh, I think Voltoro is the best one. Uh, and basically, you know, you can get in and out of gold and Bitcoin very easily, and they have verified vaults all around the world. And they're not doing some weird fractional reserve creepy thing where they give you, you know, a piece of paper that says, I swear I'll give you gold if the economy collapses. And then all of a sudden they can't be found. So uh, there are some ways that if you're a gold bug, you can kind of flirt with both and, you know, have, have a little bit more flexibility. Any other question? Yeah, I guess this is mostly for Mr. Badnarik. Um, owning gold and silver sounds great, but as a practical matter, uh, I really don't have a clue as to where's the best place to get it. Do, uh, you know, if I want coins, do I invest in the gold ETF? And if I get the physical stuff, I have to bury it in my backyard. And and you know, where's the lead come into all this? <laughs> the lead, you said. Well, if you're interested in buying gold and silver, I can give you a phone number of my broker, and he'll take good care of you. Again, owning the physical gold, owning the, well, first of all, gold is not necessarily for spending. It's for retaining wealth. So you take your ounce of gold, you trade that for, you know, 30 ounces of silver, and you go to the grocery store and you buy the bread and milk and eggs with the silver. And when you run out of silver, you take another ounce of gold and trade it for more silver. So the gold is a repository. It's kind of like your bank account. And the silver is what you're going to spend. And you can get one ounce, half ounce, you know, different sizes of gold. If you study history, there was a, a Spanish pieces of eight, and it was one ounce of silver, and it was literally divided in a cross so that you could break it. You could b physically break the coin in half and give a half of a coin or a quarter of a coin or uh, one quarter could go into two bits, which if you were a kid, you remember the two bits, four bits, six bits, a dollar? This is what this comes from. I mean, this is not, it's just a historical reference. So gold and silver are heavy. I mean, if you're putting, you know, 10 or you know, 12 ounces of silver in your pocket, you're going to know. Is that inconvenient? Well, yeah, but if you're going to go buy food and that's the only thing that will buy the food, I don't think it's inconvenient anymore, right? You're trying to, you're trying to, you're trying to imagine gold and silver now while U.S. dollars are still fungible. I'm talking about when they're not. Um, and as far as the lead, once you have the gold and silver in your possession, it's like any other possession that you have. Somebody tries to, you know, steal my TV, I remind them that when you die, you can't take it with you. So if you try to take my TV, you're never going to take it with you because I'm willing to protect my physical property. Yes, I mean a bullet. <laughs> okay, I was trying to be subtle. Maybe it was too subtle. You, you might want a gun also to make them go really fast. They just uh, yeah. well, we have run out of time. Uh, if you guys can please thank our panelists with an applause, a round of applause. Thank you very much uh, to our audience also.